and welcome back. In this last series of lectures, we're going to talk about a couple of details. Uh, we titled this Thread Level Parallelism Part 3, Hardware Synchronization, How Do We Deal with Race Conditions? That's essentially that first part of it. What's deadlocked? There's some more details of OpenMP. We'll have some fun here. So let's jump right in. Hardware Synchronization. <clears throat> As a review, OpenMP has a beautiful way to, a beautiful abstraction to be able to add parallelism to your C code. You have a couple of lines of code, maybe there's a header file, and you say, I want to parallel a pragma that says, I want to parallel this for loop. And now all of a sudden, this beautiful for loop that used to be a full serial thing is now parallelized across all the threads and just works. And it works in a really nice, clever way. Um, what this means in some sense is it's doing what we talked about a couple of lectures ago. It takes a for loop and it says, all right, for i equals zero to some max value, here is max. It says, let me just chop that, that up. So maybe if it's two threads, it's going to say, well, zero to half of it. So if it's 100, zero to 49 is one of them, and 50 to 99 is the second one. So it kind of keeps each of the, each of the threads, um, each of the cores is going to be working on a, a contiguous part of memory rather than, well, one from here and one from there. You could do it that way, but it's a really bad way to do that for your caches. So you have a contiguous area of memory that each of the cores is going to be able to process. You should also have, so this is the third point says, you should have a simple shape um, to be able to parallelize something. You have to, sometimes even a, even a doubly nested loop doesn't parallelize very well. It makes more sense to kind of see if you can unwrap that to be a single top level parallelization rather than two loops inside of it. It, it gets complicated. So make sure you, 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 you practice with it. You'll see it. You'll see this as you practice with some of this, maybe for your project as well. You're not allowed to have a premature exit in any of these. So if you have this special code there, like a break, a return, an exit, a go-to is you don't put this. Uh, you know, don't 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 jump outside of any pragma within that. You you can move around inside that, but don't jump outside of the pragma. You can mess with things. That's not that's not appropriate. We talked about this. If you have two memory access, if a shared memory system, and two memory accesses form a, can form a data race. You can have two memory accesses both trying to read and update a particular variable. It doesn't even necessarily, in C code, doesn't necessarily look like that variable is going to be uh, in memory, but that, that variable a sum, we, we've tried to sum a pi, you can't uh, sometimes, depending on how you write your code, you cannot have people uh, affecting a shared variable. That, that's going to be trouble. And that's a data race. And that's a race condition. We want to try to prevent that with some kind of synchronization. Um, so you want to you want to do this. You want to you want to be able to not have to serialize all of it. Could you actually have um, everyone contribute to some shared space as they're all at the end? You have a thousand different software cores, software cores, software threads, and you want to be able to have them all add their contribution to a eventual a sum that's going to be pi, hopefully, very close approximation. How do you do that without having to do it in, ser in a serial way? Because you can imagine this this being something with now I have a million different software threads. You don't, you don't, you know, it'd be nice if you didn't have to serialize that whole part of it and make it in the serial part. How could you parallelize right to that? So that's important. We're going to see you can't do it at C. You can't write this in C. You've got to have lower level support at the hardware level to make this happen. Hardware synchronization is the secret to this. So the secret, and you're going to see this in every solution of any, any, any particular hardware device that has this problem. It happens at the upper level, language level. You need to have hardware support to fix it. And the support, the solution is something called atomic read and write. Um, this means you can read and write in a single instruction, and nobody else is permitted to, to have, uh, no other access to that is permitted between that read and write. Um, and the idea is this is in a shared memory space. So this is in a shared memory space. So a common implementation, here's how we do this in a very regular way. Um, the, this atomic is a swap between registers of memory. Um, so in some sense, you're, you're, you then link a read and a write with this, uh, and the write would fail if the memory location has been tampered with, as it says here in a slide. Um, and RISC-V has, has variations of both, but we'll talk about that. So we're going to call these uh, atomic memory operations, or AMOs. And the idea is <clears throat> you perform an operation on an, on an operand in memory, and set a destination register to the original memory value. You remember back in the day, and here's, here's a picture of what this looks like. There's a couple of instructions that are that are support this, uh, and you can see them here. Add and swap is the one we're going to see in a second. This is what it looks like if you if you look at the the way it's broken down uh, in Risk Five. And here's what's doing. You remember? I'll just I, I'll give you a summary of this slide. Um, you remember if I want to add something to a memory location. So a memory location has a value. There's a memory location that, you know, A of 5, there's a value there. And I want to add something, I want to add 10 to that value. I can't do that. There's no operation to add 10 to that value. 
The only way I can do this is to bring that value into a register, add something to that register, and put it back. It's a three-step process. What I'm telling you about this atomic memory operation is you're allowed to do that. You now, they're providing you a hardware support to do all three of those, and now we can think about how you might even build the control and data path to make it work. All three of those will happen at once, and nothing can be interrupted in this process. So what it means is, here's an example for the ad. I'm, here's an example of AMO ad. So let's take a look at that real quick and tell what, what that looks like here. And this AMO ad, here we go, AMO ad, RD, RS, and RS1. Here's what it's gonna do. I have a value in RS1, and I wanna add it to the memory locate to the value at the memory location pointed to, sorry, I have a value in RS2, and I wanna add it to the value in the memory location in RS1. And I'd also be nice if um, I, I then read the old value of RS1 and stuffed it in RD. So it's kind of a two-step process. Think about this. So this is what's happening. So let's, let's look at this. So first, I read in, this is a pointer. Okay, this is a pointer. This is star P. This is a pointer P. I'm going to read. This says read in. This is a load word into T, into a local variable T. I'm now storing that value, the old value in that, in that register, the, the old value in the memory location pointed to by RS1, and I write it into RD. That's what this says. X of RD is T, so I read, I read the old value, put it in, into T. And then I update that value. Here's the, here's the X of RS2, which says, what's the value I wanna add to? I wanna add 10 to the thing to A of five. This, so this is my star P, it's basically like 10 plus, star p. This stores my 10, and I'm going to say, this says rd gets star p. That's what's happening with this line, okay? x of rd gets star p. And then I say star p equals star p plus 10, and 10 is stored here. This says star p equals star p, which is the t, see t is star p, plus, there's my 10, okay? So it's both, so in one operation, it's doing read the old value, then do an add on what the old value was, and then put it back as the new value. That's what I do in one operation as an atomic value. And swap is this swap idea. So let's do, let's look at this. How we do if we do a swap? What happens here? Okay, the lock is going to be a register stored. The lock is going to be in memory location stored in register A zero. So A zero is a pointer to where my lock is. Remember that. Okay, so A zero is kind of the address, the P here. Got that right? And remember, setting is one and unset is, 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 is zero. Free is zero. So first, I'm going to set T zero to one. Okay, T zero equals one. Now, what does this do? AMO swap, AQ stands for acquire, RL stands for release. This is, I'm going to acquire the lock. What this says, this says, get T1 gets the old lock value. Okay, so T1 is going to get, remember, this is the old, this, if you remember the add, this guy gets the old value. And this is the new value I'm gonna to try to put in there. Okay, that's the idea here. So A0 is gonna now get, that memory location is gonna get my T0, and T1 is gonna get the old value of it, okay? The old value of whatever that lock was, the star, this star, star A0, if you think about it, okay? Now, I'm gonna spin, I'm gonna spin on this. Branch not equal to zero. So if, if T1, meaning what I got, what, I, what was there is, not, is already a one, branch not equal to zero. So if it's a one, meaning it was already grabbed, oh, it's already busy, I just go back here. I branch back up to there, and I spin on this. I spin on here. Okay, I spin weight on that. But the key is the AMO swap that makes this work. Here we go. If I fall through the branch not equal to zero, that means it was zero. So now I can do my thing. And here's the key. It's not like, remember, this is the whole thing. If I fell through it, it meant that I grabbed it. This is the whole beauty of this AMO swap. Only, it's not like, well, we both could read before. If I follow through the branch not equal to zero, this says that I have it now because I wrote the one. Nobody else wrote the one. This is an, this is an atomic operation. So only I was writing the one. If there are two competing guys and it falls through, only I'm going to be the one that falls through the branch not equal to zero. I'd be the one that actually writes the value. So now I'll fall through. If, it, if, if I don't take the branch, that means it was zero. Okay, this takes the branch if it's one, which means if it's zero, that means it was free. And I just grabbed it. That's the idea. This swap stuffed the one in there, not anybody's one, my one only. So now it's mine. 
And now I go through, now the critical second, now I own the lock. That's the key. If it wasn't, if I was doing this, if I somehow break the AMO swap, if you remember the BMO swap had like four, three things you were doing. The critical idea is only if, um, how do I say it? Because it happened atomically, it happened without any interruption, that's the reason this succeeds. Now if I get to that critical section line, I know that number one was written to by me and me alone. That was the problem before. Two people wrote the one thinking they both had it, only I had it in this case. So now, I do my critical section in red, I do it bada 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 bing, and then I want to release it. How do I release it? I release it by swapping out x0. I don't care, when I do the swap, I don't care what the old value is, I know it was a one. I know that star a0 is a one, because I owned it. This value, the old value is going to go into x0, that's ignored, nothing happens there. And I basically take my x0, which is zero, and I, I stuff this into there, and now I reset it to zero. And now it's free, I release the lock. I'm good, this is it. The critical part about it was, that AMO was an atomic operation I can read and write at the same time. So the old way, the broken synchronization is this wild lock, and we're both spinning, and two people could be in a wild lock, and they both say, oh great, the lock is free, bloop, and they both write their one thinking, I own it. Can't happen. This can happen now with this AMO swap. This is the same idea. So this is the same idea. By the way, if you try to translate one, one to one, if I just take this by the way, this is broken, okay? If I take this one to one and write this in risk five, it's not gonna work. The same, the same problem happens in risk five without this. You need the AMO SWAT to make this work. So this is, in a way, my piece of keep trying until I get it, and once I get it, I know this is mine. Now I'm guaranteed this is mine. I've got the lock, I've got this, and I unlock with the simple there. So all this kind of process through. So all this, this is this, and this is this, but done correctly. This is broken, this works. That's the idea. Pretty powerful stuff. How does this work in OpenMP? Do I have to go now? Do I have to, wait, Dan, I can't use C anymore. I have to now write Risk Five. No, you can do this in OpenMP too. Here's how it's done in OpenMP. Let's take a look. So first, we're going to declare uh, an, an a abstract data type called a lock. OMP lock sub t. Who knows what that is? I don't have any. Is it a number? Is it a whole struct? I don't care. I just I have to reserve one of them. I have a lock. Here is my parallel section. I say get thread numbers, ID is thread numbers in my parallel section, and now I want to have a piece that only I do, the sequential section. So I first say OMP set lock, and I say address of lock, and now only when I get it do I proceed into that section knowing it's only me who's in that se sequential section. By the way, all a thousand threads are all saying the same thing if they get to that at the same time, and only one of them is going to grab it, and the second one will grab it, and the third one will grab it. I print some ID, and then I end the sequential section by say, OMP unset the lock, and I have to put address of lock. So I pass it in, the pointer to that lock, both times, okay? And then, when I'm all done, I don't know whether that, that required this OMP, the lock, there was space there, I'm gonna have to free it. So uh, I had to go back to my parallel, I had a parallel section before and a parallel section afterwards, and I'm pretty good, and at the end, I'm gonna destroy that lock. And I'm all done. Pretty clean, pretty nice and pretty clean. So, that hardware synchronization was key, that AMO was key to make this work. Normally you have um, libraries that, this is true, anytime you're above the lowest level, normally you have to be able to, well in C, that's how you do it, because OpenMP, does. any other language has to have a way, every language has to have a way to synchronize these parallel things to say, nobody, only one person can own these, as I said, lock or semaphore at a time. You have to support that. So this is gonna be supported in almost every language that I know of that supports parallel programming. There's an idea of a semaphore, of an idea of a lock that's built in the system. And by the way, the way it builds it in is by going down to, and actually making a call to the AML levels below that. It'll actually compile or interpret down to that. That's the key here. Oh, OpenMP also has other pragma for other things. Critical cases, atomic, barrier ordered. There are other things. Please read the manuals in the bottom. There's many more features, private variables, reductions, a lot of stuff in there. Um, if you're going to really dive deep into OpenMP, there's a link that uh, at the openmp.org site that has uh, there. And there's a nice hands-on documentation, which is useful to play with that. There's a tutorial there. So here's an example of a critical section. Here's an example of another way to do this. Um, mutual, exclusion set, mutual exclusion says that only one thread at a time can be in the critical section, and they're gonna wait their turn into the, make their, wait their turn. So let's go back into our, you know, adding up, uh, trying to approximate the value of pi. I can just say here, look at this, look how clean and beautiful this is. I can do the lock, I certainly can do the lock, and that would be fine, I can work, work with that, and, but it's a lot more piece I have to make a lock and reserve it and blah, 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 or I can just say OMP critical. Very beautiful and very clean. So I've got OMP parallel. Here's the open and close here. OMP parallel, open, and, actually, open and 
close here. This is important. This is an open and close here for that open P parallel. And within this little range is open P critical. This, this is the loop that closes here. So this is the line there. And right inside the parallel, say I'm saying, this is a critical section within the parallel section saying, this guy better be only one thread at a time. And there it is, pi plus equals some ID, and it works. So we started, we started by, if you remember, by the way, there's a thousand threads here, software threads. We started by saying, well, let's just have a couple threads for, it would be fine. Then we said, well, why don't we have a thousand threads? Well, then it's kind of annoying at the end, I have to wait till the thousand things, to, they're all done to be able to add them up. That's a little annoying, it's not really a big deal for a thousand, but if I had that number of threads is a lot bigger, that'd be, that'd be a problem. How can I synchronize that? Well, let's just, let's just put that pi plus equals, and then we introduced, we introduced explicitly a race condition just to teach what race conditions were. Then we said, well, how can we get back? And so now I'm at the point of, like, right paren, I'm, I'm now closing the thought, the, the thread, the conversation about uh, how to do this. And so I introduced a problem to then fix it to be able to teach you what this critical section was and how, how you can do this with hardware synchronization. And that's the, that's the key piece here. Now, now that I bring up this idea of locks, I now have to bring up the second kind of problem that you have introduced with, <laughs> with parallel code, which is deadlock. We talked about race conditions and how to deal with race conditions with these locks, but once you introduce a lock or semaphore, you now have the possibility of deadlock. What is deadlock? The deadlock is a situation where multiple actors are each waiting for each other and we're frozen. Live lock, by the way, is the same idea, but people are moving, there's, there's motion, but still you're kind of stuck. Um, so deadlock is, oh, you're lurched, and I'm waiting for you, you're waiting for me, and no one, nothing moves. Um, here's a beautiful picture just to show you of deadlock, and I believe this is uh, a traffic jam. I think this is in, Ch in China, I'm not sure where this is uh, within that, but someone took a picture of a beautiful case of deadlock that computer scientists all around the world said, aha, deadlock, and we all grabbed that photograph and are using it in our, in our slides to teach deadlock. I mean, that's amazing. All it takes is, is one car, if just like one car could, could I mean, look at this, like, no, no one can move, they're all, they're, the problem is, you know, you get in there, oh, let me just back up, well, people behind you, now nobody can move at all, because if, if you're actually pack it in so no one moves, you're literally stuck, no way to do this. Um, if you just judge, a little, if this guy could just move here, move here, then these guys can get through, and then it all frees up. But you can have this kind of situation if you don't have the traffic lights set up rightly. The most famous deadlock, by the way, is this called the dining philosophers problem. And here's the problem, you have these philosophers uh, around the table, um, and each of them, in parallel, this is a parallel system, thinks a little bit, because they're philosophers, they think about something, and then uh, they grab a left fork, it's available, and if it is, pick it up. And then there's a fork on both sides, by the way. Five people and five forks is the idea. You can do this again with like two chopsticks, one on each side, but let's just do this one, okay? Think until the left fork is available, if when it is, pick it up. Think until the right fork is available, when it is, pick it up. When both forks are held, I don't know who eats with two forks, but <laughs> eat for a fixed amount of time. So two forks and you're like, maybe you're pulling apart some meat, I don't know, pulling apart some piece of tofu or something, okay? And then, when you're done, put the right fork down, put the left fork down, repeat from the beginning. Well, what can happen is, everybody goes and picks up the left fork. And everyone is now spin waiting on the right fork, but everyone picked up a left fork. And so this looks, actually works better with chopsticks, to be honest. And so <laughs> everyone goes to the right one, and there's no right one. So all five are stuck in this deadlock scenario where there's no, and just, just like the, the parking situation, no, 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 the traffic jam, no one can grab their right fork, so nothing happens. Here's an example of live lock. You walk past somebody in the hallway, and you say, oh, I'm so sorry. And you go like this, but you, that person also walks like that. You say, I'm sorry, sorry. And you walk like this, and you do this. And the person follows you mirrors trying to do this. And if, you, if these are kind of robots, you can imagine a scenario where each robot pauses for the same amount of time and then moves to the right, and then pauses for the same amount of time and moves to the left, and never pass each other, ever. You can imagine a little simulation where they just do this wiggle back and forth. That would be a problem. <laughs> so all this is deadlock. We have to think about how to, how to prevent that. What are some solutions to think about preventing deadlock? We'll let you think about that, but that is something certainly we need to think about. We also want to talk about timing. We want to be able to think, how do we prove that this wonderful, how do I, how do I adjust the parameters to make this parallel program work faster? Um, 
Normally, if I were looking at 621B, 621A, and an algorithm, I'd do an algorithm analysis and count the number of basic primitive operations, and I'd have what's called a running time, which is the number of primitive steps. It's not time. By the way, running time is not time. You learn, you learn this in CS10, 621A, and 621B. It's not time. It's primitive operations. It's a count. It's a count, really. And it's a count. So it's a, you know, as, how, does the, how do things grow as the size of the input grows? That's what running time is. We said, don't use the clock. Don't use wall clock time or stopwatch time. Well... When you're running parallel code, often you do use wall clock time because you have a thousand things. You might, you're, you care less about how many steps each of these threads does, but how much faster is this parallelization compared to before? So in some sense, you are using wall clock time. So let's go back to the, let me undo the idea that you never use wall clock time to actually do that. OMP or OpenMP provides uh, some support, some software support to be able to help you with that. And what they do is they provide something called open, OMP get w time, which is a void. Uh, it returns a double, but it doesn't make any arguments. The idea is it returns the elapsed wall clock time in seconds from some other time in the past. And the way you can then figure this out is you have two calls. You assign at the time, maybe it's like seconds since 1900. Who knows? Seconds since the year five. Who knows what that is? It's some random, it's some random, it's some value, it's some, some value of, of the number of, uh, of some time in the past. Boom. And now I then run my code. I then split it 14 ways. I join, I split and fork and join, and I come back and I stop it. And now I can say, and some, there are some parameters to this. So maybe it was the number of threads I have or how I do something, or maybe the algorithm, whatever I'm doing. I'm doing something and I want to kind of measure this better than this as the number of threads goes up, say, or this as I run this on different machines or machines that have a different number of, of logical or, 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 or physical CPUs. So then you have a second, you have the end time, and then you just subtract these two. So this is the number of seconds since, say, 1900. This is the number of seconds since 1900 in, in the future. And if I subtract these two, then the, the only thing I'm left with is the difference in time between start and end. So that's how you use OMP get w time as a way to measure wall clock time to see how some parallel analysis works, okay? That's the end of this mini lecture. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks so much.